We continue to preview the 2024 college football season. Our stop today is Caldwell, Idaho, and we get to visit with the head football coach for the College of Idaho Yotes, Mike Moroski, heading into his 11th season with the program. Coach, 10-3 and three last year. Let's talk a little bit about that because it was it was a good journey and almost to the pinnacle. You make it to the national semifinals, a 28-21 loss in that game to Kaiser. I know there were a lot more wins, but that, that was the last time we saw you all on the field. A one-score game, and really there were opportunities in, in that game as well. It was very, very tight. Tell us a little bit about last year to bring us to where we are. Yeah, it was a it was a great year. We had um and it's always fun to get on a run near the end of the season when it when it matters and uh you know, we we had kind of um gone through the the league and our conference, the Frontier Conference is very very tough and uh it was um you know, we lost to Montana Tech early in the season and very close game. We won some close games, a walk off against uh, Montana Western. And then still we were in the driver's seat and then uh, didn't play our best game in the last week of the regular season against Southern Oregon. And they're a very good team. They'll be back. They've uh, you were probably around when they won the national title. And, and uh, I, I think they're doing a great job and they'll be back. So that was disappointing. And I was thrilled that we just got in the playoffs, to be honest with you. Fortunately, we were ranked high enough and um, the committee still got us in there. We needed a buy. So we had a buy in the first round um, and then had to play Montana Western over over in uh, Dillon, Montana. And that's turned into quite the rivalry. And um, I would say we played our best game. It was uh, we, we got fortunate with the weather and and uh it was a it was a great day and we moved the ball really well but i thought our defense was just beginning to come around at that time believe it or not sometimes seasons are like that i didn't think we played um well i just thought we not not underachieved but we just hadn't found our mix of guys and our and our footing on defense and it began to show up a little bit against Montana Western in that game. They're a very, very good team, very great uh, quarterback. And, and Coach Norris does a great job in every phase. So we were thrilled to win that game. We went up by two touchdowns late. They scored late. But, I, again, I thought it was our best game. The next game was against Grandview, uh, a notorious power that we ran into in the playoffs in 2019. And a fairly close game, but they're they're very, very good defensively. Again, they were ranked, I, I think, number one defensively in the country. And um, and we somehow held the doors on the defense, uh, held them to three field goals. They got inside the 20 three different times in the first half. So, but and we couldn't do much on offense. So it was nine to nothing at, at the halftime. And um Hats off to our coaches. I thought we uh, made some some great adjustments, knew we were close on a couple of things. And then the game just kind of rolled our way in the second half. The defense continued to play great, and we uh, found a way to move the ball, found some things. And, and uh, anyway, and it was a close game. And then, then we got a pick six late in the game that kind of broke it open. And it was uh, m- maybe the best win we've ever had in our program's history. Wow. And that took us to the semifinals in in West Palm Beach against Kaiser. And uh, Kaiser's a really, really good football team. And uh, uh, they gave us trouble inside the red zone, which had been our forte. So that's never, never easy. But um, you see it at every level. And uh, losing by a touchdown to a great team, I think that happened to Alabama. I think it happened to... Uh, Texas against Washington and and uh it's just it just happens it was very very disappointing but uh um and our guys are uh resilient to a degree but it was crushing to be honest with you so uh but that's what what it's all about so we were very very pleased I couldn't have been happier like I said with our staff with our players our our senior leadership especially many young guys a season gets that long you go pretty deep in your, on your depth chart. And, uh, that for sure was true. And, and, uh, it's always nice to be in the mix, always nice to have a shot to win. You know, you're just looking for those opportunities. So that's kind of the way we view the world. I I like your view. I like your take on that too. And, and, uh, mentioning those other close games, you're in good company 
then that's definitely the case. But uh, still, I, I know the young men would have liked to have the W that day as well. But you, you, are, you talked about them being resilient, so another opportunity awaits. You head to the spring then, and, and how are things going in Caldwell right now? Spring practice is in the books as we're in the summertime. So we've we've worked hard, and and uh, spring football is my favorite time of year because it's a chance to develop your younger players and uh, and see if you can move the needle with some of the some of the older guys. Obviously, um, graduation does hit, and we're having to replace four starting offensive linemen. Um, among other big losses, we lost both our cornerbacks. Um, so uh, it, it's a it's an important time of year, but it's a great time of year too. There's not the um, the dilemma and the urgency to get ready for a a, a ball game, uh, but there's a different kind of urgency. So so I like to alert my staff that we have to make strides. We have to make big strides both schematically and then. Um, bring the younger players along. So it, it was a great spring. Again, I, I love it because um, I love the teaching aspect. I love the uh, developmental aspect. We, we do get a, a few transfers, no doubt, but uh, we're, my philosophy is to, is to build. I believe in the four-year experience. I believe in, in a strong academics. I believe in guys being great people and um but spring is a, is a time where where you can push you can teach and uh really see some some great things and, and i thought we did this spring well you take that and then you head it into uh, the summer and the fall camp coming up soon and i'd like to to look at at uh, the offense and, and preview your team just a little bit we start with offense and uh, obviously losing four starting offensive lineman is going to have a, a little bit of effect and or can has the potential for that for what you all bring up uh, Andy Peters we have to start with him there and and uh, I'm sure he's he's going to be looking for that support that that offensive line I'm sure went a long way to helping him have the season he did a dual threat quarterback overall and the uh, most passing yards in program history last season was a fantastic year tell us a little bit about your offense well, having Andy and, and Andy's now started for two straight years, and um, and so so my feeling about quarterbacks is every repetition that they get, or every fifty repetitions, you know, game reps are are important, and they they he continues to make strides. So he made great strides from last year after. Uh, the 22 season, I thought he was phenomenal last year in, in many, many respects. And I think he has a desire to get better, uh, which I love. The The glaring thing, most glaring thing for us, I think, is our completion percentage. Now, we're not a, averse to uh, pushing the ball down the field. I thought he did a good job throwing the ball away, but he's a very, very accurate thrower. And so we're we need to complete more balls. We feel like we need to be up in the, in the mid sixties. And so that's our goal and that's hard against really good defenses. And so, uh, but I love Andy's attitude and, and he, he really has emerged as a, as a leader. And um, I mean, he's, he's very hard worker, very well respected uh, in the weight room. He's a, uh, full of energy. He loves to practice. He loves to work at the game. So, so having a returner at quarterback is really, really um, nice. You know, we had that last year and an experienced offensive line. So this year, minus the experienced offensive line, minus John Schofield, mm -hmm. who scored 22 touchdowns last year, minus uh, Alamar Alexander, who was a very steady Eddie, do everything running back. And minus Ben Ruby, a uh, very, very tough fullback tight end who was very instrumental in our um, program development. I mean, th these guys were all uh, program makers for us, as well as just having a great season last year. So so we have a lot of work to do. And uh, but that that's the nature of college football, too, Joey, as, as you know, it's it's a. Uh, you're always losing guys and and it's and that's the 
the secret, I think, for, for programs is to how effective can you be in developing players and, and getting guys to fill those roles, both in the leadership way and, and uh, um, you know, also the productivity realm of, of a football team. I'm fond of saying to our team that every year is new. Every team is different. You know, we're, we're uh, yes, hopefully riding on the shoulders of the 2023 team, but 2024 is a whole new deal. A whole new group of freshmen are on their way uh, that we'll see this summer. Guys taking on new roles, even the guys that are back, it will be arguably a new role for them. But uh, I like where we are. We have some good players coming back on offense. Some need to come back from injuries. Um, I think we'll figure it out on, on uh, the offensive line. I think we have some good recruits coming in and uh, some good returners who are, who are chomping at the bit to play. Um, and, uh, and a couple of guys that played a good bit of football for us uh, at receiver. I think uh, we've made one move, moving Keegan Croteau from who has started at corner and started at safety. He's moving over to offense to play receiver local guy from, from Boise, Idaho. And, and uh, we feel like he could make a difference. So that's part of our thing too, is we try to find the, the right place for guys and where they can help us the most. But Brock Richardson coming back, I think is critical. He, um, I think he had an ACL going into the uh, Kaiser game, probably did it in the first half of the Grandview game somehow played and caught six or seven balls in the second half of the Grandview game, but then just couldn't go against Kaiser. So uh, he, he needs to make it back just for, um, again, leadership purposes. And he's, he's arguably our most dynamic uh, guy, but we have, we have some talent. John Kreps is coming back at a great year at receiver. Uh, Hunter Gilbert had a great year at running back, got hurt against in the playoff game against Western, but, he's got a chance to win the national championship and the 400 hurdles, you know, in the NAIA track thing. So uh, he's a, a great dynamic athlete and player. And so, so I like where we are, but in our coaches, it's just a matter of um, being, um, seeing, seeing the, the vision that, that what we can put together with this group of guys, new group of guys and, and the great opportunity that they have. So we're, we're excited about the offense. We really are. We're visiting now with coach Mike Morosky from college of Idaho and coach, by the way, I, I just, I'll tell you now, I was, I was going to save this till later, but uh, I was visiting with, with my wife last night, said I was going to get to visit with you today. I just told her outright, I could listen to you for hours on end. I, I appreciate the wisdom that you bring uh, and, and your perspective on football and, and all kinds of things. Let, let's go to the defensive side of the ball there really quickly. A number of players coming back that are, are going to be you know upperclassmen for you. Uh, we're upperclassmen, but continuing to fill some roles. Uh, Willie Nelson coming back, leading the team in tackles last year. Both uh, Tanner Leaf, Cooper Leaf coming back as well. Jacob Arbs coming back. Talk a little bit about uh, your defense then. We played a lot of lot of guys last year, and and uh, which, which is a, which is a good thing. But we were really working hard to uh, find the the right roles, the right spots, and um, and that'll be continue to be what we we try to do. So it's nice to have returners. It's nice to have guys who who played, even moved around. Take Willie Nelson, for instance. He came to us as a linebacker. We moved him to defensive end last year. He played at about 240 something pounds, did lead the team in tackles, but we still felt like he left a lot. He, he can be better. So, so he's worked hard. He's embraced that. He's lost, I think, close to 20 pounds. Is much faster. Uh, as, as you know, football is full of starts and stops and getting to the ball, getting off blocks on the, on the defensive side and, and, uh, so, so I'm excited about what, what Willie's doing. And, and he also is a fantastic um, leader by example. He's very passionate. Um, and uh, again, the way, the, the way these guys, Andy Peters included, but, but uh, these guys on defense, Jacob Arms, Willie Nelson, uh, the Leaf Twins, 
they love the game. They love to practice. And I think that might be the singular number one thing that um, is helping us right now is, is it helps our young players, of course, because you played some football. I'm sure I remember my early days in high school and college and, and even the pro level where I couldn't wait till practice was over. I mean, uh, <laughs> truth be told. And sometimes it's boring. Sometimes it's uh it's just flat, hard or hot or, or whatever, or cold or whatever. We get all those, by the way, in the spring in Idaho. I mean, I still haven't quite figured out the spring weather patterns in Idaho, but we were in snow, thunderstorms, heat, and uh, uh, gale force winds. I thought for sure the tornadoes were hitting uh, hitting out here, but uh, but that's all part of it. That's the beauty of football. You, you do what you do. And, and, uh, but, but loving to practice is, is a, is a big deal. I don't think we, I, I know I didn't strategize. Hey, how can we make practice more fun? And, and, uh, no, we do what we do. I think it's more the group of guys, they see the importance of it and we try to not waste any time. I, I, I feel like that's one of my biggest jobs is to not waste the players times. These guys, go to class they uh they're required to go to class if class conflicts with football they go to class and uh, and that that's really really important to me it's really important to the college and um uh, i think it's the uh essence and substance of what college athletics is and it would blow my mind if people don't go to class and and uh or on zoom classes which, which i which i think is pretty prevalent at, at certain places but uh I believe in going to class. I believe we're a stepping stone to future success. And um, I love uh, guys doing it all. Uh, most of our guys have jobs. They have full loads of classes and they still love coming out to practice. So, so uh, you know, and I tell them that the college days are the greatest days of your life. It, it, for sure, the least busy. And um uh, so don't complain about being too busy. You're not too busy. So uh, anyway, so they laugh and uh, they they get my sense of humor. And um, but we love being on the practice field and and working hard. And and so Willie really sets the tone for the defense. Jacob Arms is another one who uh, has played uh, three or four different positions since he's been here at College of Idaho. Started on offense, has played every safety position uh even moved him out even moved him out to corner a little bit the leafs have moved around too and and again their their energy is infectious and and uh again love to play so so i like where we are on defense too we're going to have some roles to fill special teams wise as uh you'll be looking for a new kicker looking for a new punter too coming in uh, it is an important part of the game uh, talk about him, how you might fill those roles no doubt. And we're uh, still recruiting, as a matter of fact, but have a couple guys waiting in the wings. Uh, Gavin Mink is a punter. Um, Will Botch is a kicker. But I always like competition. Uh, I would say we haven't. Um, we have a ways to go. I mean, special teams we work, work very, very hard at. We've gotten good in our coverage units. Uh, because we've gotten in 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 the eleven years that I've been here, we've we've just gotten a little bit more athletic. Um, I believe in in special teams. I believe your kickoff team has to be your best unit and should reflect who you are as a football program. And um, but uh, the actual. Uh, striking of the ball, uh, I think we could be better at. So the guys are working hard. They know that we're going to get some uh, some competition going. And uh, uh, we didn't make a lot of field goals last year, for instance. And, and uh, in tight games, you know, that was the, that was the difference. Um, um, I think uh, Kaiser made a field goal or two in, um, in that game. Uh, so we can put ourselves as, at a disadvantage. I'm not averse to going for it on fourth down, but uh, still you, you want to be able to get points when they're out there available to you. And, and uh, we need to be better at that. So, so I'm excited about where we are, especially with the guys running down on the coverage units. Um, 
but uh, and I'm looking forward to the competition of the of the punting and and kicking duties. Well, coach, I, I mentioned, and again, just listening to what you were talking about practice and and uh, the players out there, attitudes of what goes around. Uh, has to be a part of the culture that is there. And it's not something that happens overnight, obviously heading into your 11th season as well. Uh, the team would be a reflection of your take and, and your leadership. So talk a little bit about the culture and, and what do you see as a couple of things that are instrumental in making that culture the positive thing that it is? Um, my first thought there, Joey, is, um, you know, culture is a, a, an elusive sort of thing uh, very dependent on the on the players um, but I take it personally I mean it's very very coach intensive uh, also so so the first thing is and it's great that we have pretty great stability in the coaching staff um, can't pay my guys very much but I but I like it to be a, a great place to come to work um, and I'll just say briefly, you know, a couple of my stints in, uh, pro ball with Atlanta when they weren't very good and, and with the Houston Oilers when they weren't great, um, you know, you could tell the coaches didn't love to come to work. They were there. And, and, um, so, so I make it, a and, and I hear about for, in, in other programs and may, maybe just guys that interview and guys that I know around the country that, you know, coaching's a tough job and, and at the higher levels, guys are getting paid a lot, but it can be miserable. It can be a lot of pressure, all those things. But the last thing I want to do is to have the pressure that I'm putting on the coaches um, somehow impede their progress, impede their individuality, impede their joy in, in coaching, because I think that all trickles down. So if they're feeling like they're under the gun uh, from me, um, you know, and then that trickles down to the players. That's not a good thing. So, so somehow it, it, and I think about this all the time, Joey, I want you to know this isn't a, I don't have this written down or I, I still feel like I'm getting better. I mean, there, there's no handbook on culture 101 in, in my opinion. Um, but what I, what I do is at the, at the same time, I want expectations high. And, and so I expect a lot out of the coaches and, and uh, try not to uh, impose my will or micromanage. But at the same time, they have to know that I believe that coaching is the most important role on the, on the football team when I'm, when I'm talking to the coaches. And um, so that's been great. My defensive coordinator, Chris Jewell has been with me for a long time and his, his background is nothing like my background. I, I think he looked at me when he first took the job here and said, where the hell are you from? Who, you know, what is, what is going on here? You know, and, and uh, cause he was used to uh, recruiting JC guys and just getting the best possible product on the field where I come from a situation, UC Davis, where we're all about developing uh, first and foremost, young men, but also developing young football players. And, um, but, uh, you know, I, I love hearing Coach Jewell talk about these things because he'll say, you know what, I've, I thought he was crazy, but uh, I love, it, love every bit of it now. So, so he's, a, he's a true believer now, and he does a great job on, on defense and in a uh, whole, uh, coaching the staff and, and getting them lined up. We have a, a, a couple of former players on the defensive side of the ball, which always helps. Um, so, so I think that's a real good thing in, in a program to have guys that want to come back and coach in your program. Yeah. And then offensively, our offensive coordinator will be in his fifth season, Brian Taylor. And, um, he would tell a funny story, may, may, probably not funny to him, but uh, we lost our uh, an offensive coordinator that I had from UC Davis, a guy that I coached and is currently the offensive line coach at, at Davis. And I didn't let him coach the quarterbacks either because he wasn't a quarterback uh, by trade. And uh, 
he finally talked me into it and you know I'm I'm tough on the op, tougher on the offensive coordinator probably and and uh, Brian similarly was a tight end in in college at Pacific University a division 3 program in Oregon and I was very hesitant to let him coach the quarterbacks and call the plays but really I use that because I just want I I I think the quarterback is a obviously a critical position on any football team so um but but and Brian does coach the quarterbacks and he does call the plays, you know, so, so we, we've worked through that. It's just that I have to, I'm ultimately responsible. And my number one goal is to take the pressure off, take the external pressures off of the coordinators. So, uh, so I am the one that makes the final decision on the quarterback. If there's a quarterback controversy, I'm the one that makes the tough personnel decisions uh, if they need to be made if on from anything from travel roster to who's starting on offense or defense. I want the coordinators to be able to coach football. Obviously, they advise me and, and have their opinions, and I want them to be opinionated. But again, back to my philosophy of culture is the staff has to be hitting on all cylinders. And so that's my... Uh, my number one goal and I work hard at that and I, and I love doing that. Sorry. Were you going to say something? No, 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 not at all. I'd make sure that I was, I was able to still hear you. Okay, great. Yeah, uh, and so I, again, I, I believe in the trickle down theory. If the staff is having fun and hitting on all cylinders, then you have a chance for the players to, to do that too. So, so we're always talking about, um, uh, uh, how can we get the most out of our players? Just, just like everybody in the country. And uh, I, I tend to not be a sound bite guy. Um, my son uh, is on the um, medical staff at Clemson University. So I love going to Clemson. I watched a couple spring practices and love coach Dabo Sweeney. I think he, he may be one of the greatest coaches of all time at the college level. And you go there and you got all these sayings all over the place, you know, and, and, uh, but I'm not a soundbite guy. So, so it works for Dabo. He makes it work. And, uh, I tend to want to appeal to the intelligence of our, of our players, even though they're just young guys, 18 to 23 year olds, I feel like the luckiest guy in the world to be able to work with these guys. And, um, and I want them to, somehow embrace um, having high expectations, not imposed from the coach, even though we do do that. Um, and I believe young young people need help in um, learning how to have high personal expectations. Um, but for instance, so our mantra this spring was self-evaluation self-evaluation you know most young guys they come in and they always evaluate themselves as pretty darn good you know and they're used to uh watching film in this sense uh that they like to watch their own highlight films and um and so that translates sometimes too and i, and I think you could pull all the all the players in the country at any level of college football and say well, who do you look at when you're when you're watching film? And they'd say, well, I look at myself. Mm -hmm. um, so what we want to do, what I want to do is give them an appreciation for the greatness of the game of college football. And so that means you have to look at more than just yourself and you have to evaluate yourself with very, very objective standards. So we talked about um, setting the standard, meeting the standard and then raising the standard. And then I'll segue real quick, Joey, into a couple of Bill Walsh quotes that uh, I was happy to be with Bill for, for one season, a couple training camps, and, and don't pretend to have gleaned much, but uh, from his writings, from other things, and, and things that I've morphed into my own uh, comfort level, you know, he said famously, um, culture precedes championships so what i take from that is it's not just something you you stick on at the end or or you make it a goal in the in the off season to 
boy, we're Joey, we're really going to try to improve our culture this year. I think it's something from day one. I think it's 24 seven, 365 days a year. It's all culture based. Um, so again, culture precedes championships. And so, so we've worked hard on this from day one, but really it's how do you treat people? Uh, how do you move people? How do you inspire people? I don't think you can, and excuse my language, Joey, I don't think you can bullshit college football players for very long, maybe for a short time, but, uh, but not for very long. And again, that gets back to my philosophy of, uh, appealing to the intelligence of, of the young guys. I think they're smart guys. I think they're uh, really great guys. I think they got all the potential in the world and it's my job to, to help them achieve uh, their goals. The other thing about culture is um, that um, when I mentioned that the self-evaluation and the um, you know, setting the standard, meeting the standard, raising the standard. Coach Walsh said, when you have a group of guys that have high personal standards, I mean, they, meaning they have high expectations for themselves, it's not so much they're imposing them on other people or yelling and screaming or, or whatever it is, uh, but high personal standards for themselves. In other words, they're disciplined in the way they approach their life and school and not perfect, mind you. And, and uh, I want guys to be improving in all these areas. Um, but in the weight room, for instance, you know, it just, you know, I just got a message from our strength and conditioning coach and he said, coach, this, this might be the most enthusiastic, most enthusiasm I've seen in the weight room um, in our history here. And I thought, all right, that's uh, that's fantastic. I like that. You know, it, it obviously you need to have the numbers that match up to that. Mm -hmm. But why not? If you're going to do anything, had a coach here who's now at Southern Oregon. I, I love the saying of his. It said enthusiasm is so critical because it's contagious. Um, but that hits along with what Coach Walsh was getting at, I think, where if you have a group of guys, even a small group of guys on the team, and this is where we started, small group of guys on the team, who have high aspirations for themselves, high bill coach Walsh called it standards of excellence. So if you have these internal standards of excellence that are always being raised um, and then it starts to spread a little bit from guy to guy uh, in your organization. Again, I don't think it's a, a manufactured thing or a thing that you can impose or a thing that you could tell a guy, Hey, I really, really like your high aspirations. Why don't you try to sell that to the rest of the team? I don't, I don't know if it works or I haven't figured out how, how to make that work. So I don't even try that. I, I tend to land on the side of respecting the young guys that I coach and, and uh, letting it happen organically uh, for, for lack of a better term, but Anyway, Coach Walsh continued, if you have something, a group of guys, small group of guys who have these high expectations for themselves and it begins to spread a little bit on the team and maybe even spreads a little bit more, he said, now you have something special. Now you have something going on. My interpretation of that is now your culture is really starting to take hold. And so... Again, I think that's where we are a little bit. Again, I go back to something I said earlier, Joey, just that uh, every team is different. You can't presume that the culture from 2022 or 2023 is going to automatically take place in, in 2024 because every team is different and every team manifests differently. And um but that's kind of the way I approach that. I try to do that in subtle ways with our with our staff. Um, but I've had staff members who are off doing great things. I said, hey, coach, why don't you have a leadership training program on the team? And um, and we do do leadership development things, Joey. But 
but I don't know what leadership training is. It, it depends on the individual. It depends on the life circumstance. It depends on where we are pre-COVID, post-COVID. We got all hell breaking loose all over the world. Um, I don't know what guys are thinking. I don't know what leadership is going gonna, is gonna to look like, but I tend to err on the side of, hey, I'm here to support these guys. I'm here to... Um, help these guys be great in lots of different areas. I'm here to help these guys be great people. Uh, the few things that we stand for are treat each other great. Obviously we got all sorts of cultural differences on the, on the team, meaning uh, races, black, white, Hispanic, you know, everything. Um, all sorts of religion, it's on the team from non-religious to Muslim to Christian to all those things. Welcome to the real world. You know, I'm, I'm not going to impose my beliefs on them. I want them to thrive. And the only thing that we need to um, uh, impose anything on, and it's, it's self-explanatory is, can we have some respect for each other? Mm -hmm. Can we respect each other? Can we, cause we're going to go to war together war proverbially there talking about on Saturdays playing the greatest game on the face of the earth. Um, but there should just be a high level of respect, the seniors to the freshmen, new guys to the old guys, you know, across race, religious, non-religious, whatever, whatever it is. And, and, uh, again, it's uh 24 seven and, and 365. but, but that's what I love about it. And on top of that, you, I want to coach the game at the highest level possible and be uh, uh, have our coaches want to be great at coaching drills, coaching schemes, coaching, researching new schemes. we we'll always have to be evolving, always have to be adapting, always have to be resilient. And it all fits together, I guess, is my uh, my thought. Wow. Coach, I, my day is better now. Uh, than it was before we got on the broadcast today. I, I appreciate that. I've been encouraged, by the way, and and learned some things along the way. But I I think just the the perspective that that you bring it's it's been very encouraging to me. Thank you. I'm 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 really glad. No, I want to ask you one more question. I'm not signing off. I just okay. To... I hope I'm not taking up too oh, much no, time. Just, Joe. Just, you kind of got me rolling there. there. Thank you for that because I really appreciated that. Now, I I will ask one other question though. Okay, we season starts roughly three and a half months actually uh you get going on the 24th so we're really it's less than three and a half months away you have a couple of games in august both of them at home both of them against california teams uh, uh august 24th which i i guess it's that's even before week zero is that like week minus one uh with that one on august 24th you have lincoln coming in and then the the next saturday august 31st is simpson uh coming coming in for a game there talk a little bit about the opening to the season um, the, the most difficult thing, and we, we had a similar opening last year with Lincoln and they are a complete unknown and, um, and they've had their struggles, but I, but I appreciate what they're going through relatively new program, but they have some athletes. They have some athletes that are as good as we see all year long. So it's a very, very challenging opener, uh, for us. And then Simpson is a, brand new program playing their first full schedule. I think they're going to come into the frontier conference, but I haven't heard. And seems like I'm the last to know on most of those things, but I, I don't worry about them, but they are on the schedule. And um, both those games will be our first night games that we've had, which, which will be fun. It's very hot here in the Boise Valley uh, in August. So I think that'll be a lot of fun for our fans. They've been clamoring for a, 7 p.m. start so we'll so we'll do that but uh i think that'll be exciting for our players too so it so again i i love training camp i want the players to love it uh, i think those are two very very challenging games um i'm all about um competitive opportunities um so so those two non-league games mean we're playing 11 regular season games, which is more than we usually do. But early on in the program, we played an 11th game. We played Portland State. We played Northern Colorado, which were uh, 
you know, difficult steps, steps up for us, but I thought they helped us. I thought they helped our development. So I, so I think the 11th game will help us in, in this regard to, uh, again, Lincoln is, is trying to move up and be, I think division two. Um, so they will always be a challenge and we do not take them lightly at all. And Simpson is, um, uh, you know, who knows what they're going to be. They're going to be a complete unknown. And, um, but that's also good for us. I think it's, it's all about that adaptability. And, and uh, so excited about the season. Then we get into the Frontier Conference, and, and uh, I think there's probably seven teams that can, that can win the conference title. It just seems like that every year. So that's uh, a lot of fun. That's what we prepare for. And um, uh, I'm just as excited as ever, Joey. So, so I've never, never been more excited. So it's, so it's always fun going into a, uh, a new season with a new team. I, well, I'm excited too, Coach. I think you you've built my excitement level up already, and and I tried to get started a little bit earlier this year in in getting to visit with you all, and and here we are in the middle of May, and and I'm I'm ready to see something happen right now. So I, I appreciate you building up my excitement level in that. The Yotes, ten and three last season, national semifinalists last season, bringing back a, a star quarterback. Keep players on defense and, and looking to fill some other roles along the way. We are definitely going to follow you all this season and, and continue uh, to do that. Coach, thank you so much for taking time with us today. I, I appreciate it. I mean that. The rest of my day, I, I'm built up to do more things. I, I work outside of sports, too. I, man, the rest of my day is going to go better just from thinking about the things that you talked about, too. And I, and I appreciate you your time today. Thank you so much, sir. Well, thanks, Joey. Appreciate you having me on. And let me know if I can help in any way.